what to do to follow that. Um, first of all, I thought I'd better warn those of the nervous position that my speech will contain violence, nudity, and nothing real for your audience participation. <laughs> to assist you in this, I have a little blue triangle. If that is on the slide, you know the next slide will have one of those to be on. <laughs> As you can see, this slide has a blue triangle. <laughs> it's audience participation time. Uh, can you put your hand up if this is a familiar scene? Either you've witnessed it, or you've actually participated in doing this activity. It's like to say, right, and I apologize for my blood all papers. Um, quite a few people. Children do this before they can speak. They start to draw, they make marks, they do it on paper, they do it on walls. This is something that is inherent. It is something that is unique to us as a species. These are drawings. In 1970, sorry, 1994, a couple of potholders. That's a lot of strange kind of pastime. Going down holes at weekends, but hey. Um, <laughs> Cherbeau Caves in some France. They were potholing, they felt the draft coming through. What they thought was a wall of rock. Um, they thought, where's that air coming from? So they began to investigate, they moved some of the rock, they found this huge hole, they went through, vast cavern. And they found these pictures that had been drawn on the wall. The carbon dating showed that these are 32,000 years old. Incredible pieces of artwork. Look at this. These are lions chasing bison. This particular drawing that actually used the contours of the rock to show these bears looking down on the actual lions. Incredible pieces of artwork. 32,000 years. These are the oldest known pieces of artwork produced by us from the sapiens. But then if you go and look throughout the world, Patagonia, this is what we call negative hands. The artist here has put the hand against the wall. They've chewed some kind of pigment and then they've spat on the wall to make a stencil. And this they produced. Argentina, Burma, and there you can see, it's come out of the world. Now this is in the day before EasyJet. You couldn't pay £29 to fly to Australia and say, hey, I've seen a fantastic bit of decoration in the cave. Let's go back and spit on the wall. <laughs> this has got to be something that is within us. We are all artists. It's pictures that were first used to communicate hieroglyphics on the Egyptian walls. It wasn't then until the Rosetta Stone where we start to see language appearing as a written form. The top of the Rosetta Stone is hieroglyphics, the middle is demonic, and the bottom is ancient Greece. And this particular stone can then interpret those particular languages. But it's interesting, although we started by making marks on walls, it is a two-dimensional art sculpture that has been the leading force up until we reached the Renaissance. This, as you can see, is called the Venus of Willendorf. It was discovered in a small town in Austria, 22,000 years old. It's a small figure, it's about not, uh, 11 centimetres tall, and it's made out of limestone covered with red ochre. They think it's a sign of fertility, hence the rather large chest. <laughs> and by the way, I hope you saw there was a blue triangle before this came up. <laughs> And sculpture dominated the art world. These are Egyptian sculptures. Uh, if you noticed that there's, though we can recognize them as human forms, the amount of subtlety there isn't quite what we call human. They're rather bulky, they're rather square. They have the standard pose, one foot forward, one foot back, hands down by the side. But it's still an incredible achievement that they were carving like this. It wasn't really until the Greeks started to spread their wings and they brought back on the left hand side is their version of the gentleman duck, the Egyptian form of sculpture. And then on the right hand side you can see where they started to move it to. They started to have things that were animated. The figure is in a more natural pose, the arm is pushed forward. They started to look at a human form. And then 
Look at this. This is from 190 BC. Look at the carving on that. The, the actual textures on that cloth look as if you can touch them. This is carved from stone. The craftsmanship that has gone into these particular sculptures is incredible. And then the thing about art, that artists always embrace the latest technology. This is a bronze cast made by uh, Greeks. We think it's Poseidon, or it could be Zeus, but the technique they use is a technique called the loss of wax method. They would actually mould the figure out of clay, then they would cover the clay with a layer of wax, and then they would put another layer of clay on top of that wax, and they would hold that in place by putting nails through into the clay beneath. Then they would heat up the whole of the form, the wax would melt out, leaving a layer right across the original piece of sculpture they'd made from the clay. Then they would fill that gap with the bronze, and you'd have these incredible sculptures produced. It's larger than life size, and it is currently in Athens. Whilst they were producing those bronze sculptures, this is where their painting was. This is a painting from the Aegean school, still very flat, still painted on a wall as a fresco. Even through all the way to Byzantine art, we're still creating flat images. If you look at the figure of Christ, he looks like a little man. He looks like a little ventral to his stomach. It wasn't really until an artist called Giotto who began to experiment with perspective that started to make the world look more three-dimensional. Even the great Leonardo, his figures were still very stylized. His version of the but Jesus Christ is still like a little man sitting on the Madonna's lap. <laughs> Yet Leonardo, we could perhaps say, was a genius, and he was probably the first product designer. He was the man who then experimented with all these incredible ideas. He thought of war machines, he thought of different uh, machines for getting round, he looked at weaponry, he also experimented. He was the first person to start looking at the human form and to see what actually made us work as humans. <coughs> Michelangelo. On the right is a sculpture called Gator, Pity. But look at the work that's gone into that. The body of Christ looks like he's heavy. His blood is literally holding him up. And yet his figures were still rather crude, very bulky. Raphael. This is called School of Athens. In the Renaissance time, they really began to understand what perspective was. Here we have an incredible painting that forms the whole wall, probably the size of this wall here in the Vatican. Now, that particular painting, you've not only got the perspective, you've got flowers, figures, the figures are all based on people from Greece. Now, I'd like to think, when you look at this particular picture, because you can actually find out who these people are. I know that, um, for instance, number seven is Alexander the Great. Number 14 and 15 are Plato um, and Aristotle. Number 16, I think the man who's prostate on the steps is George Papandreas. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> he's probably going through the same kind of problems. Um, also, I wonder. Did that particular picture inspire that? I'd also like to think that perhaps Pope Julius II, as cardinals, having done a day of blessing wine, used to sneak into this room. And they'd go back and they'd look at that picture, and they'd start saying, who's the bug behind Ringo? <laughs> Is it true that Paul's dead? But who knows? We went there. And then we got um, Watching those films, that we just see that David played to show us. Um, they're all inspiring. You suddenly think, God, isn't the planet we live on incredible? When I see these pictures, I get the same feeling. This is where I think painting really took off. These were produced in 1602. I'm going to show you four paintings by an artist called Caravaggio, who I personally think has been the greatest living artist that we have seen on this planet. When he was commissioned to paint these, this particular painting, and I'll show you the next one at the same time, it was for a small chapel in Rome. And about three years ago, we organized a school trip and we went there and we had to do little back streets. 
um, and we went to the chapel, and you see these paintings. He refused to paint altarpieces. He worked in the studio. He was also a bit of a rebel. You might say he was the first kind of typical what we aspire or we call a painter. It's um, conversion of St. Paul. St. Paul was a legionnaire. He was sent to go and round up the Jews and bring them into Bethlehem. And on the way to Damascus, he had this blind vision, fell off his horse. The painting in this, the foreshortening, you can understand that this man has had this incredible experience as he lies prostrate on the floor. And then at the same time, he also painted this. And this was the other side of the altarpiece in this chapel in Rome. And this is the first painting of a crucifixion that actually looks as if this is a dreadful act that these men are participating in. You can see that the figure on the ground is actually feeling the weight of the figure. The use of the light is just incredible. It looks like a photograph. And in the same year, he produced this painting about Doubting Thomas. The composition, you really focus on those four heads as Thomas puts his finger into the wound to prove that Jesus has come back. Just an incredible piece of work. And finally, he then also produced this in 1602. And the critics didn't like it. They hated it. Because this had really moved painting forward from this flat painting on a wall. The elbow of the, artist, of the chap on the right, it really comes out. The composition draws you into the head of Jesus Christ. This is the first painting that Jesus Christ appeared without a beard. He broke all the conventions that had gone before and produced incredible artwork. And so sculpture and painting move side by side until the mid 1800s where a particular invention, the camera, had to revolutionise the way artists work. Here we have um, one image by Joseph Leaps, which is probably the first photograph. It was produced in 1827. That's the first picture that actually could be fixed. Before then, people had produced pictures, but they just began to fade because there was no fixing techniques. And so from that, I'll just actually show this is a timeline. <coughs> On the left hand side, in the middle, are the art movements up to the invention of the camera. And then beyond that are the number of art movements that took off, as it were, against technology. So since the 1900s, we've had all those particular art movements. I ran out of space, I could have gone on a lot further. Whoops, there's a blue triangle. Oh, audience participation time. So, with all these art movements and technology spreading, artists became perhaps more important than the art they were producing. They became more famous. So, can you name the artists? Top row. David Hurst, correct. Picasso. Yeah. 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 Roy Lichtenstein, well done. Have a merit as you leave the theatre. But art has an importance in our society. It's a huge generation of money. Here we have, in third place, the most third most expensive painting ever sold at auction, Dora Maar and her cat, and a wonderful price of $95 million. In second place, we have a painting, again, by Picasso, $104 million. That painting was bought by somebody, nobody knows who, and it currently lives, nobody knows where. And finally, this was bought a couple of years ago, nude, green bars and bust, $106 million, bought by a Georgian oligarch. But he then gave it to Ted Britain for two years. I think that was a bit of a scam because they can look after and pay the insurance. If you've got something that costs that amount of money, there's a lot of insurance going on there. And the one that got away. A very famous casino owner in America called Steve Wynn. A multi billionaire owned this particular painting. He did a deal to sell it for 139 million. And then Mr. Wynn had a dreadful accident. 
He fell over and put his elbow through it. I wonder what he said. Um, <laughs> what I would have said. Anyway, um, so Mr. Wynn's kept that, and he keeps it in a restaurant in his casino. I don't know. And then we have Damien Hurst. This particular piece of work, for the love of God, is made from a platinum cast of human skull. It is encased in 8,601 pure clear diamonds. It cost 14 million pounds to make. Mr. Hurst did not put a finger on that particular item until it was presented to him by the craftspeople who made it. He put an exhibition in the white cube with an asking price of 50 million pounds. Who says art oh, doesn't make money? We think it sold for 38 million. Mr. Hurst said it sold for 50 million. If it did sell for 50 million pounds, it made it the most expensive piece of art by a living artist. Two signatures. Salvador Dali, in the last 10 years of his life, didn't produce any work. He signed pieces of blank paper. <laughs> no, that's right. However, since his death, those pieces of paper live in a vault in Paris. Whenever they think the market is right, they take out those bits of blank paper, with Salvador Dali's signature on, they then print one or two Salvador Dali prints on it, they sell them and make a lot of money. People are paying for the signature. Signature below, Picasso. There are wonderful stories that Picasso, when he went out to restaurants in the south of France, people would say, no, no, don't pay. Can you sign a napkin? Can you do a little drawing of a napkin? There's a story that a lady saw him in a restaurant in Paris, approached him and said, please, Mr. Picasso, would you do a drawing for me? And he obliged, he drew on the little napkin, he signed it, and he said, that'll be a million pounds for it. <laughs> Ten seconds work? He goes, no, that's 60 years work. <laughs> These images are known throughout the world. They're in our psyche. Art is important because we make us understand how we are. But the good thing about art is we can parry the <laughs> <laughs> I think I went out with the one on the left. No. <laughs> then we went to America. <laughs> no, that's um, and modern technology. I think people get the wrong idea what art is about sometimes. Artists are always striving to use the latest technology. These are all produced by David Hockney. He uses an iPad. He says, I wake up in the morning, I see a wonderful sunrise. If I draw it in a sketch pad, I will, it will stay beside my bed. He works on an iPad and then texts it to his friends and within seconds, 50, 100, 200 people have got a David Hockney on their iPad. He had an exhibition in Paris last year where the iPads were displayed around the room. People can interact with them, they can make pictures bigger, smaller, they can press the animation, watch each particular movement that he stroked and made those particular images. Artists move on with technology. The art world in Britain alone makes billions of pounds for this country through computer games. Computer games generate more money than films from Hollywood. We've got computer generated images. The fashion world, <coughs> our designers are some of the best in the world. Jonathan Ives, the right hand man at Apple, has got 400 Apple patents to his name. He was educated in an art school. It's sad to think that when it comes to hard times, the arts education is the first to suffer. And when the governments tell us that we should push people to do English baccalaureate and arts isn't mentioned, it really grieves me. And finally, back where we started from. The most popular painting or exhibition in the last two years was a Banksy exhibition in Bristol. And I just thought we'd finish with this because it shows a piece of graffiti spraying off the cave painting. And the ironic thing is, Camden County Council sprayed that off the wall too. <laughs> Thank you.